welcome to the world of chiropractic, where we take one epic journey around the world as we explore the seven regions of the World Federation of Chiropractic. My name is Dr. Rebecca Wilkes, and I invite you to travel with me as we go on this exciting adventure around the globe. Uh, Dr. Gertz, welcome to the world of chiropractic. Hello, thank you so much for, for having me today. I really appreciate it. It's great to see you. It's great to see you also, and thank you for donating your time to us. Let's start with the World Federation of Chiropractic. Uh, you are the new research chair. Can you tell us a little bit more about the research committee, um, about your chair position and, and what your initiatives are? Certainly. Well, I, first of all, I'm just honored to be the the new um, research chair. I have been on the WFC research committee for I think about eight years now as the vice chair. And so I um, had the opportunity to learn from um, Dr. Greg Kochuk and um, before him, Dr. Scott Haldeman and, in, and what they did with that role. And so I'm, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to be involved at this level with with the with the WFC research committee and and I, I think there's a we really have an unprecedented opportunity now to rethink how we best connect clinicians to to our research efforts and and first of all I, I'm I'm really looking forward to taking a more multi stakeholder approach to research. I, I actually tried to talk them into putting a patient on, on the research committee and um, was not successful in that. But I think moving in that direction of really looking at who, you know, who are the end users of our research and, and how can we make sure that the work that we're doing is, is directly relevant to doctors of chiropractic and the, the patients that we, we all serve. And then the other thing that I, I personally am interested in, so we'll, um, though we, we have actually not had a, a meeting since I became chair. So I'm, I'm speaking now of my own personal opinion, not on behalf of actually either the WFC or, um, or the research committee, but I, I would love to see us t um, look at how we can develop an international research agenda. For, chiro for chiropractic, that we have such scarce resources. And, and I think if we're able to find some ways to come together and what are the most important questions that are facing um, doctors of chiropractic and, and our patients and figuring out how to rigorously answer those questions in a, in a coordinated way, I think we're gonna be a lot further ahead in, in a shorter period of time. You had mentioned kind of hopping back to the patient and trying to incorporate the patient as part of the committee. I saw an email the other day and it was entitled new research committee membership underscores WFC's be epic commitment. Um, do you tell us a little bit more about that? Part of being epic is being evidence-based and, and I, I think this is uh, an opportunity for all of us. We have a, a, a several new members that are that are going to be joining us and it's an opportunity for all of us to commit to providing the information that that we're able to as as scientists to 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 help um, engender the kinds of conversations that that we that we tend to have you know some of those pointy headed conversations that scientists um, that scientists like to have but but also being very pragmatic and I'm a very pragmatic where the rubber meets the road kind of scientist. I want to make sure that the, the questions that I answer, that the research that I'm doing actually is going to make a difference and, and that it, it's something that clinicians will be able to use to rethink, you know, either reaffirm or rethink some of, some of their, their um, clinical practices and that patients and policymakers and other stakeholders will um, have the data they need, need to make really informed decisions about, about the, the best health care. It could be very different in other countries, but in, in the United States, we are really rapidly transitioning towards a more value-based health care delivery system where not only will we be looking at you know, what is the cost of delivering services, but what is the, what is the value? So what is the quality of those services that are that are being delivered? And 
I actually think that this is a, a unique opportunity for doctors of chiropractic because really high quality evidence-based chiropractic care should do very well in, in value-based clinical settings. But we have to make sure that we've got that evidence base, that, we've, that we are making sure that our research focuses on the questions that are, that are most important to, to clinicians and to patients and, and payers and, and employers and health systems and, and other stakeholders. You know, we have a mandate, you know, as, as members of the research committee, but, but I, I think we have a lot of um, autonomy in figuring out exactly what our agenda is. And, and, but I, I would not even presume to determine what that agenda is without, um, without working closely with, with the other members of the research committee to, um, to develop it. It's a, quite a, a large committee, but, but that's really important because many of us, we, we span the breadth of, of um, scientific interests and research methodologies and, um, and national, nationalities that I, I think is really important to make sure that we are, that, that we're being comprehensive in the ways that we, that we think about research and evidence. Right. And are all of these members all doctors of chiropractic? I no, they are they are all invested in chiropractic research in one way or another, but they are they are not all DCs. Except for a patient that is not involved at this point. <laughs> there, there is no there is no patient yet. <laughs> we'll see. I, I'm gonna ask again in a couple of years. Right. You've got several asking opportunities. So <laughs> I, I do. That's exactly right. So, so you are also heavily involved at Duke University. One, you are, from what I understand, the Director of Systems Development and Coordination for Spine Health, and you're also a professor of musculoskeletal research. Is that correct? That, that, is, that is correct. I'm a, um, I'm a full-time faculty member in the um, Duke University School of Medicine, and I, I really, I split my... Um, my time in two um, somewhat separate but really related roles. And the first as a professor in musculoskeletal research is really the opportunity to, to think about those important questions that I was just talking about and, and figure out how to you know, put together multidisciplinary teams to answer them in a, in a rigorous um, way. And then, and then the other part of my job is to figure out how do we implement the research evidence that we already have within, um, within a multidisciplinary healthcare center um, or setting to make sure that we're optimizing, um, we're optimizing spine, spine healthcare for, for our patients. So you're working within the School of Medicine, and you're also working towards almost an integrative type of philosophy, also focusing on spine care. How does that dynamic work within allopathic medicine and also uh, kind of the chiropractic portion of it? Well, spine, spine care delivery is often a multidisciplinary practice. It is very common for patients to see a number of different kinds of providers. And, and the type of care that's recommended by guidelines is, is also delivered by a number of, of, you know, of people with, with um, you know, different clinical expertise and, and backgrounds. So in a lot of ways, it's, a, it's an ideal fit. But, but I think it also gives us an opportunity to, um, to, to focus as a, as a healthcare community on what, on what the guidelines currently recommend. And, and for instance, right now, the American College of Physicians guideline on low back pain recommends that patients try conservative care such as massage and acupuncture and yoga and tai chi and spinal manipulation before they try any prescription medications. So it's, it's important that clinicians with expertise in those, um, in those you know, it, with those modalities are, are part of the healthcare team. And that's um, amazing that you can kind of spearhead such a, such a charge at such a prestigious university. 
I feel fortunate every day to have the opportunity to work with the amazing team of clinicians and, and professional staff and administrators. I mean, we all have the same goal, which is to make sure that we're taking the very best care of, po um, of patients possible and that, and that we're making sure that patients are getting the right, the right patients getting the right care at the right time, depending on what their individual ne needs are. That sounds a whole lot like Be Epic. It does, doesn't it? It's catching on. It is. Uh, before you know it, it is going to be all over the place. So that's exciting. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about your system development and coordination position. So one of my very first um, mandates was to develop a white paper that outlined a strategy for, for optimal care at, at Duke, optimal spine care. And so again, it was re really focused on you know, right patient, right care, right time, and 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 what we what we developed is more of a population health approach to to spine care delivery. So really looking at looking at it from the perspective of a funnel. So so at the at the top of the funnel are are you know self care things that are that are guideline recommended by the guidelines. Things like patient education and nutrition and physical activity, and then. Maybe a little further down then are things that I, I think of as facilitated self-care. So things like yoga and Tai Chi and, and um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And then um, really envisioning then a, a first contact with clinicians would, um, would be more oriented towards conservative care also. And then only if that care was... Um, was 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 not appropriate for a person, or um, was not was not a trial of care did not lead to to um, benefit to the patient. Would we consider less conservative care, things like critical steroid injections, or or sometimes even surgery? There's there's a time and a place for for every component along that funnel, and it just depends on what what a specific patient's needs are. You have co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed papers. How do you even have time to research with just these two positions alone? <laughs> well, you know, that's a, I ask myself that a lot. <laughs> it's, uh, it, there are some long days sometimes. I, I will definitely admit that. But you have to remember, research is a group sport. And, and so the, if you look at every paper that I've written and you know, almost all of the work that I do, it's working with a team. So, so you know, to a certain extent, it's um, about you know, sort of divvying up the work and all, you know, all coming together to make sure that we've got the, the best work product possible. And, and you are heavily involved with fundraising. And at this point, from what I have heard is that you have raised over $32 million in federal funding um, as either principal investigator or also co-principal investigator, primarily mm -hmm. with the NIH and also the DOD. Is that correct? Yep, that, that is, I'm very proud to say that that, that is correct. And of course, I've had a long career now. <laughs> I've been doing this for, almost 30 years so um, so so you you'd hope that that it, the research funding would would start to um, would start to accumulate after after that many years but I, I feel like I've been very fortunate in in having amazing um, amazing co-investigators and and sometimes co-pis to to work with and in order to make sure that we're asking questions that that really matter to clinicians and patients, and and that really matter to funding um, sources as, as well, because they they all have their their missions and and priorities, and and that's that's really what being a successful investigator takes. You have to be able to marry your own interests with you know public health need with the particular interests of funding agencies. Do you have any recommendations or advice to individuals who might be looking to pursue uh, just trying to get funding? Well, I would say it, it, it is difficult. And I, I think in some ways it's more difficult now than, than it's ever been. And, and I, all I can say is, you know, team, team, team is it, it really, it, you really have to put together 
the team that will that will help you refine your questions because you know I've never developed a research question all by myself in, in my life. You know I, I might have an idea, but bringing it to a multidisciplinary team where there are clinicians in the room and statisticians and um, and and people from from other disciplines can really make sure that you've you know thought through you know what um, what the best question might be you know what methods are are best to to answer it so if this is something that that you're interested in I, I really recommend finding a way to get involved with with um, with a research team that already has research up and going so it, it, you know research is you could you I mean you need to have the the appropriate training scientific training in order to be a successful scientist but a lot of um, a lot of research is is um, the actual how you conduct studies and you know the logistics of it are 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 somewhat of a learn as you go and that's one of the things that's really fun to, uh, that I really like about research is is you know bringing together that combination of scientific rigor with the creativity that you need to make sure you're answering the right question and the creativity that you need in order to problem solve because they're I don't care what research project you're doing I don't care how brilliant you are you will you will encounter things that you did not expect during the research process and so and knowing how to handle those in an appropriate way that doesn't um, have a negative impact on on the science is is also really important you know, I forgot to mention the project managers and project leads who, who are probably the most important people on the entire team once you actually get get started and often in putting together the, the proposal as as well. But you, you need you need those boots on the ground people who are making sure that that things hum along. And the, the other way that I'm able to to um, to do what I do on a daily basis is because I've got such great team members who are making sure that you know that the daily running of my clinical trials is um, is is executed very well. So that's something that you know. Obviously, we we have weekly meetings and you know monthly meetings to where we're able to look across what's happening and make sure that we're staying um, staying in touch. And you know, I'm available at any time if there if there are questions or issues that that arise. But but I'm fortunate that I don't have to be the one that that is in charge of making sure every day that that each piece of the study is in place. And, and this is especially important with a kind of large, pragmatic, um, multi-site studies that that I'm starting to do now more and more. It just it it takes a village to to get all of that done. And you know, we've been fortunate to have just excellent people on, on the ground making sure that it does. And, and speaking of these maybe larger studies that you are are getting into at this point in time, uh, could you speak to any any of it? Maybe not exactly what you're doing, but maybe the subject matter or in general, maybe what your interest is at this point? Sure. So I always think of research as, I mean, some people may have heard me say this before, but, you know, like we have the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. It's Sort of like we have we have the we have the ghost of research past present and and future. So you're always and, and you ha you really have to think in those three dimensions throughout your career. So I'll just give you an example. So in the past week, I have been working on editing a paper that is um, hopefully soon to be submitted for publication on on the, what we call the ACT-1 study. It was a large multi-site study we did um, within the Department of Defense, which looked at what happens when you add chiropractic care to usual medical care for um, enlisted military personnel with, with low back pain. And the primary results from that paper were published in an open access journal called JAMA Network Open almost three years ago. And I'd really um, encourage everyone who's listening to, if you haven't already read that paper, you can just go to um, Google JAMA Network Open and then Gertz and, and that paper, you'll pull up that paper and you're able to go and download it for, um, 
for free and 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 read it. We've had over eighty seven thousand views of of that paper since it was since it was was published. We've done some secondary analysis, so we're working on on publishing the the results of that secondary analysis. So that's sort of research past, and then it had. Um, you know, weekly team meetings and, you know, lots of work in between those meetings on, on a current study that I'm the co-PI of um, that we, we call Verdict. And Verdict is looking at what we call dosing of chiropractic services in, um, in our veterans. So we are randomizing people to receive um, either what we call a low dose of chiropractic, which is basically between one and five visits or a higher dose of chiropractic, which is you know, between eight and, and 12 visits over a, over a 10 week period of time. And then we are re-randomizing people to either have, um, to, to either be discharged to usual care or to have one chiropractic visit um, scheduled a, a month to look at that that issue of what Medicare calls maintenance care, but we call, you know, sort of chronic, chronic chiropractic care. But we have a study that that we hope will be funded that that has not yet been been funded, but um, but looks somewhat somewhat promising that we're we're also putting paying some some attention to. We've been responding to. Um, NIH has come back and asked us a bunch of questions that that we've re responded to, and now we're just waiting to see if if that study is is in fact funded. And and that study is looking at at um, what what happens to a, a patient's healthcare trajectory if um, if their um, their first contact provider is a physical therapist or a doctor of chiropractic versus a primary care physician. That'll be very interesting. It will be. Yes, I'm, I'm fingers crossed that um, that that we're able to move forward with that study. Is there even a, a projected timeline in in something like that when you're trying to wait back to here? Well, um, so it's taken two years to get to this point. We first submitted it two years ago, and then we did not get funded, and so they, we resubmitted it, and um, now are, are um, hopeful that maybe the second time was, was the charm on, on this, but it will, th this grant is set up with a one-year planning year. And then you have a whole bunch of milestones that you have to meet. And, and then if you meet those milestones, then you're funded for an additional four years. So it will be a five-year study altogether. It takes a, at least nine months from the time that you submit a grant to NIH until, until you get it. At least that's been my experience. And sometimes it can take far longer. Okay. That's probably a good timeline for individuals to know about. NIH funded clinical trials is, is not the, the best career choice for you if you need rapid results. Let me put it that way. <laughs> you have to have endurance and patience, but you're you rewarded do. in the end. <laughs> you do. That's, that's exactly right. Well, if someone were to be interested in, in hearing about the studies that you're doing and hearing about maybe the progress that you're making and, and things like that, is there a certain avenue that they can follow you to get updates on something like that? Yeah, absolutely. You can um, my my um, uh, on Twitter. I'm at Christine Gertz, and and I do um, tweet about some of the things that I'm I'm working on, as well as you know the the research of others that that I think is particularly important. And once in a while, something about you know Tom Brady actually getting treated by a chiropractor. So so um, try to put a little bit of fun stuff in there every every now and then. Obviously, if you go into um, PubMed and search for my name, you know, you know, Gertz, and then just put a, a C after that, there, there are only a couple of us, and I am not the one who's doing research on whales, so, um, <laughs> so that, that's one, one way to, to sort of narrow it down. That definitely narrows it down. Another way to absolutely stay on, on top of research is to sign up, go to the Spine IQ website at spineiq.org. And if you click on the, the clinicians um, side, which is on, on the right, 
uh, you'll get a pop up to put in your email, your name and email address, and then we'll send you um, research information every Wednesday. And I did, I went to the Spine IQ website and it's very, it's very, very streamlined. You go to the left if you're a patient, you go to the right if you're a clinician, and then you have very set out, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, and it just takes you straight there. So, so very easy to navigate. How oh, good that um, I'm glad to hear that. Thanks for that feedback. Yeah. And, and you are actually the um, CEO of uh, mm -hmm. the, what's actually Spine Institute for Quality, correct? Right. The Spine Institute for Quality. I'm the, the founder and, and CEO. It, you know, Spine IQ really started because, gosh, this is going on probably close to 10 years now. I, I got a call from um, who is, it, you know, he's since retired, but Senator Tom Harkin, his office called me and said, I need an, I need to see a chiropractor in Old Town Alexandria. Who do you recommend? And I realized, you know, and I'm, I'm as connected as anybody. And I struggle a little bit with how to answer that question. And I realized, oh, you know, how do patients answer that question? You know, how did, so it really all started with, you know, how do we answer the question? How do you find a good one? And, and so what, what we've done, our mission is to define quality, demonstrate value and build trust in, in spine care delivery and really looking at taking a data-driven approach. So we have a, a map that where the patients can, can search for a, a doctor of chiropractic and, and a bunch of people have maps, but the thing that's really different about our map is that the 20,000 doctors of chiropractic and physical therapists that are on our map have actually, they have been recognized by us at, at the bronze quality level. And that means, um, and what we, we chose to recognize those people who have um, reported to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, who who, um, who were um, participated in PQRS or or um, other quality payment programs by CMS and and the reason why we chose that is because it these are these are people who um, who certified to CMS that they were collecting patient um, level data either um, physical function or um, pain information pain level information and that they were including that information in their treatment plan. And so we, we felt that while that's not a perfect measure, it, you know, they were, they were following best practices as far as um, quality, um, quality reporting goes. And then we also, we have the silver level and with um, the silver level recognition is we have, a, we have a program where we can collect patient satisfaction data directly from, um, from the patient. So what happens is the um, is the doctor of chiropractic or the front desk staff just has to give a flyer to the patient. They just text a, a code to a to a phone number. They get a hyperlink to the um, CAPS patient satisfaction survey, which is really the industry standard in measuring patient satisfaction. The patient can just fill it out on their phone um, in about three minutes or on their computer, and then we give the doctor a quarterly report. And then um, once the once you have a, a, a minimum of fifteen um, surveys completed, then um, we will recognize you at the silver um, status level, and then we'll create a little mini website for you and um, list the insurance companies that you that you interact with. Uh, we'll list the the techniques that you you practice and you know link to your website et cetera and your pay well we post your patient satisfaction data so that patient with your permission obviously so that patients are able to to have data before they before they walk into your office and you know what's awesome about this that you started out with is the thing that conceived this entire thought process was the patient Right. That's, that's exactly right. Did you know you were going to go into research when you were in school? I knew that I was going into research by the time I was done with my chiropractic program, but not when I started. I, I feel like I, I accidentally became a scientist. I, I, um, I, I was planning a clinical practice like all of my, like all of my fellow students were. And then 
I had um, I had had about three and a half years of college, but I did not quite have my degree when I started chiropractic practice. So they had a program at Northwestern Health Sciences University, which is where I graduated, where if you um, took a, a research sequence and met some other criteria that you could get a, a bachelor's of science degree in human biology. So I decided to do that. And it was really in taking that research sequence that, that I discovered, you know, how I was just fascinated by learning more about the research process and, and just the promise and, you know, of, of research. And, and back then and 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, you know, there was very little chiropractic evidence. And so I um, started working as a, as a research assistant in the research department there. And, and by the time I graduated, I, in fact, a, a really good close friend of mine was um, in, in medical school at the same time that I was in chiropractic school. And um, he, he helped plan my graduation party. And, and a couple of days later, I was talking to him on the phone and he said, so you're, you're graduated from chiropractic school. You know, what are you doing? And I said, I'm not going to tell you. And he said, really, what are you doing? And I said, I'm studying for the GRE. <laughs> I was already planning to, um, to go to grad school at, the, at that point. What are the degrees that you have? Well, I have my doctor of chiropractic degree, obviously the, the bachelor's degree. I'm certified to practice acupuncture. Um, and I have, um, I have a PhD in health services research policy and administration. And and from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. I was really drawn by that, um, that ability to, to study in an, in an area that brought together the things that I thought were really important to taking the best care of patients, which is rigorous research, good health policy, and smart administration. Well, are you currently living in Durham, North Carolina? Yes, I, I am, but I also spend a lot of time in, in Iowa. So I have an adjunct position at the University of Iowa in the Department of Epidemiology and, and the Verdict Grant has uh, one of our clinical sites is in, in Iowa City and, and the new grant would also um, involve Iowa, um, University of Iowa. So, so I'm really, you know, while I'm primarily in, in Durham, I do, I do still spend some time in, in Iowa. And I have, a, I have a lot of family in, in Iowa as well. My husband and I have seven um, children between us and six of them live in, live in Iowa. And my mother lives in Iowa. Uh, a little bit of the world of chiropractic is learning about the areas that the individuals live in. Just some unique facts in case maybe they wanted to relocate to that area. Maybe they were interested in that area. Could you mm -hmm. give me uh, two unique facts about both North Carolina and Iowa? I would, well, um, this is Black History Month. So let me um, say that in, um, in, in Durham is, is where, um, as, as far as, as we're aware, the, the, the first um, um, basketball game occurred between uh, both a black and, and white players. So um, I'm just reading a, a book on, on, on that now, uh, um, which is, is just fascinating. Tell us a little bit, what another, maybe a unique fact about Iowa? Iowa is not flat. I think when <laughs> people always think of Iowa as flat, I hear lots of people tell me that, but it's not, they're thinking of Nebraska. <laughs> Nebraska really is flat, but Iowa has a lot of rolling hills and is just absolutely beautiful. Okay, so definitely go with your camera handy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would, would really recommend that. Well, could you tell the viewers a unique fact about you they may not know? Let's see. I, um, I love to cook. I, um, I think sometimes maybe I should be tweeting out recipes, you know, along with my... Um, with with the with the latest research, I um, I mentioned before that my husband and I have um, seven kids be, between us. I'm trying to trying to think of of what else. I um, I love to to walk. I I walk between two and a half and four miles every day. 
um, uh, an active chiropractor. <laughs> active chiropractor. Well, I think most chiropractors probably walk more miles than than that every day. You know, across their office as they're as they're going from patient to patient. So I, I just need to stay in as good a shape as my colleagues. <laughs> well, what type of what's your favorite type of dish to cook? Well, you know, it's there's my favorite type of dish to cook is probably um, is probably some kind of a dessert. But what I cook most often is uh, sheet pan dinners. Sheet pan dinners are the best thing in the world. You can just put put your protein and put your vegetables and you know some you know any kind of vegetable mix on on that put it in in the oven for about 25 minutes at 425 and no matter what you have it turns out delicious well, that's good to know that sounds like it's a uh, working smarter not harder yeah that, that's exactly right you asked me earlier how you know how do i get everything done well that that's one of the ways that i get everything done <laughs> that makes complete sense. <laughs> well, one final question. Uh, one of the WFC's 20 principles, they have a 20 principles document, which you are well aware of, I'm sure, about their kind of identity, their stance uh, within the, the field of chiropractic, who they are. And one of those principles is talking about fostering the next generation of chiropractors and, and really supporting them. So, if you had any piece of advice for younger chiropractors who may be considering the field of research, could you offer any advice to them? I would say um, find a way to get a research experience. You know, find, find a mentor and you can, you know, I, I know that that can sound intimidating sometimes, but a mentor can be um, one of the faculty members if you're still in chiropractic school or a mentor could be, um, if there, if you are read research articles, if there are authors that um, that you that you that really are focused on the type of work that that you're interested in, every um, first author or, or corresponding author on an article has their email address right right there. So contact them. You'll they would will be more willing than you would think to. Um, to you know, to have a conversation with you, to have an email exchange with you. In in today's um, very competitive research market, it's 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 pretty impossible to become an in independent investigator without an advanced degree. And I think you know, may you know, probably may be possible with um, with a, a, an MPH or another master's degree. But I, I think uh, more and more, I see my colleagues that are becoming independent investigators with, with a PhD as well. So explore what, um, what the opportunities are for additional education if you don't already have that, that additional education. But again, you know, surrounding yourself by people that are doing the, the things that you want to be doing and, and learning from those, um, from, from those mentors is, is something that I would really recommend. And then read as many journal articles as you can. You know, there are more and more the articles are open access, which means that you're able to um, get them for free. If you don't know how to start, go to www.spineiq.org and sign up for our, our weekly backlog that you'll get hyperlinks to um, articles. Most of them we do open access whenever we can. So that you're that just gives you a, a place to start, but read as many research articles that, as you can. Well, Dr. Gertz, I want to sincerely thank you for offering the time that I am sure you don't have given the schedule that you have elaborated on in this interview. So we truly appreciate your time and dedicating to us to letting viewers know more about maybe where they can go to advance the field of chiropractic and to learn a little bit more about you. So thank you so much. It is my pleasure. Thank you.